a denim jacket with silver claws. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I mean, they might say, do you know what I mean? They, they say I'm working on a denim story for a, a music video. So we would kind of run through the showroom and kind of show them what we have that fits into that brief. Hello, LA. We're here talking and shopping in the City of Angels. Join me, Lauren Walker Lee, as we make our way through this vibrant metropolis, exploring the unique people and spaces who create the essence of LA style. LA sets the stage for bold experimentation, artistic flair, and sustainable sensibilities. Let's take a fashion forward trip through Los Angeles. Today I am meeting with fashion PR maven, Portia Shaw, co-founder of The Pop Group. Portia architects the growth of her clients from root to success, securing press coverage and priceless celebrity placements. With offices in LA and London, she has her finger on the pulse and a major black book of contacts. Let's go talking and shopping with Portia Shaw. So good to see you. So good to see you. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Oh my God, me welcome, welcome. This is the madhouse. This is your Aladdin's cave. This is our baby here on Melrose Avenue. We've been here for five years. So we've got a real mix of brands in here. We've got brands just like this one here, which is Luca Filoni. It's Italian menswear. They've been going for about seven years now, actually, and started online. And then we've also got brands like Black Paris, They've got stores all around Asia. Um, everything they do is black. They kind of coin the phrase, all black, everything. But then we've also got some of our younger brands like by Chevelli, who is an independent designer who's based in New York and she just does earrings. Really, really sweet. Everything's kind of handmade in her studio. We love that. We feel like whenever a stylist or an editor or an influencer is coming to us, we've got something for everyone. It doesn't matter what they're looking for. So Portia, there is the showroom here, the showroom in London, your new online piece of technology, but I think it's best to start at the beginning. Oh gosh, okay, so yeah, Rewind 2011. I started Pop in London um, on my own with a loan of, I wanna say it was like 5,000 British pounds that I had to repay to my parents. And I got my first mini, mini, mini office in, in Oxford Circus. And it was me and an intern, five brands. And I started on the 1st of August. And I remember this because September was a month away. And before I knew it, I suddenly had like five runway shows to do as well. And it was fantastic. I mean, it was crazy. It was long days, late nights, early starts, but it was fantastic. And, and the business really organically just kind of snowboarded. I was really fortunate. I had the support of many editors and particularly the freelance stylists that were phenomenal to me and continue to be and, and the team. So you bring up freelance stylists yeah. who come in here often. Yeah. Freelance stylists, editors, yeah. influencers, and the all-important celebrity stylist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So they come in, they'll have a brief for something, whether it's an editorial for a magazine shoot, whether they're doing some kind of red carpet event, and they'll be like, right, I'm looking for... <laughs> A denim jacket with silver claws. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I mean, they might say, do you know what I mean? They, they say I'm working on a denim story for a, a music video. So we would kind of run through the showroom and kind of show them what we have that fits into that brief. And, you know, we like, as you can already see, we've got such a mix of brands here. Do you find that you're dressing a lot of musicians? Absolutely. We work with a ton of singers. We've dressed, uh, gosh, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, Carrie Underwood. Will you tell me the Beyonce story? Oh my gosh, so Patty Wilson is Beyonce's stylist and she called in um, some Graham Cruz for a Tiffany campaign that they were doing. Now obviously because it's Beyonce, um, she can't just have off the peg or off the shelf. So that became a custom bodice and I think Graham actually did a couple of bodices for her, both of which we used. And it was, it was super exciting because he's doing it made to measure for her and very specific to like Patty's vision and her art direction, but you know, using his skill and craft and technique. Having the trust and the belief by someone like Patty Wilson that you are the right brand to be seen on this caliber of celebrity is a huge deal. Like it's a game changer. And for that designer, once they get that kind of placement, 
don't get me wrong, it's not that they're set for life, but what they get off the back of that is very beneficial. They'll nearly always get a ton of private orders. Um, they'll often be spotted by other international pop stars who see Beyonce wearing something and think, okay, I want to do that. So it really does have a, a, a trickle down effect. So celebrity placements and endorsements are very important as we know, but in this like rise of social media and influencer culture, what have you seen in terms of changes in your world? I mean, the whole industry has changed. You know, PR when I started in it, gosh, 20 years ago, is very different from how it is now. And I think that essentially um, our roles as PR, they're not redundant. They've just completely evolved and adapted. And not only are we, um, you know, giving people advice on um, who to be using for all of their campaigns and art direction for that, we're helping them a little bit on the, you know, the pandemic changed how brands run their businesses. Like now not everyone is working in seasons. Some people are doing product drops as and when. And for us as PRs, it, we're kind of narrating a very different story for these brands and making sure that we're drip feeding interesting pieces about what they're up to to the relevant journalists when it's happening. But I mean, our actual business for the pop group here has changed massively because we incorporated some software. We recognized straight away that actually brands were really struggling to pay PRs for showroom services, but they still wanted to have their pieces available to stylists so, uh, and by trusted stylists at that, not just anyone and so we actually built some software back in 2021 which we launched last year where brands would have their stuff visible on a digital showroom where trusted um, stylists and editors that work with us to be able to select and request items and that for us has been game-changing for the brands that are on there there are brands that are on there for like four weeks and we're suddenly getting front covers on magazines and like red carpet placements someone got like the cover of Dita Von Tees after like three weeks of being on there like that is unheard of and we only turned a year old on the 1st of June with that software. That's amazing. So yeah. it's affordable for the independent brand yeah. or the up and coming designer. They're getting great results. They're getting great visibility. You're working with new and exciting people. You are evolving your business yeah. all in this online showroom, all online polling platform. It is really exciting. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, I, when I started this business, it was because you know, brands like these really, really excited me. They're different, they're fun, they're unique. It's not stuff mm -hmm. that you're necessarily gonna see off the shelf. I mean, how cute is that? Brands like this just always, always excited me. And so being able to give them visibility and to give them that push they need to take their business to the next stage is really, really exciting. And my business partner, Laurie, who runs the London office, like we're both the driving force behind this. This is both like a massive passion of ours. I mean, we literally live, breathe and eat it, so. This catsuit is by uh, Sarah Regensberger, who is a uh, designer based in London. Everything that she does is vegan. This catsuit has been worn by Taylor Swift. It has also been worn by Lady Gaga for the cover of Vogue magazine. It's been worn by a ton of people, but this seems to be like a, a staple in our showroom that whenever a stylist comes in, they're doing a big name, it seems to go out. And whether it's layered or used as a solo piece, it's like one of those hero products. And it comes in a ton of different colorways. She's got it in red, she's got it in pink, she's got it in rose. So because of PR and influencer culture and we're like seeing all these unboxing videos, can you speak a little bit to maybe it's gotten a bit too much and how we can like dial it back and be mindful and balanced? I mean, I literally want to hold in my handbag if I see another unboxing video. It's too much. It's too much. It's unrealistic. I was listening to a podcast the other day with Vogue Williams called My Therapist Ghosted Me. Um, and she was talking about a celebrity that does unboxing videos every month on a Chanel bag, um, not gifted, they buy it themselves. And I think when you see people on social media doing things like that, it gives normal folk like you and me an unrealistic, and also at times, not, not to sound negative, an, an unobtainable um, grasp on what's really within our reach. And I think that it is our responsibility as PRs to guide brands a bit better, to tell them, you know, how it really needs to be done because there's a lot of wastage that goes out there. We're really fortunate. The brands that we work with are very mindful. They're, 
you know, Eve, even Luca Filoni, um, you know, they work with Italian artisans and Italian fabric mills, and there's not a lot of wastage, you know. Um, we're very mindful about the brands that we work with. It's been so lovely to be in your showroom, and I love that you bring up artisanal craft because we're gonna go to Abbott Kinney, and I'm gonna show you a store that does just that. Can't wait. Up here is Industry of Nations, the store I was dying to show you. We're gonna meet with Eric, their head designer, and he's gonna tell us all about the brand. Eric. Hi. Lovely to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, of course. This is Portia. Hi. Eric. Uh, Portia is a PR maven here in LA, and I really wanted to show her your shop. Of course. Okay. So welcome. So Industry of All Nations was founded in 2012 to really showcase the beauty of natural and organic and cultural heritage that all goes into the clothes. So really the name comes from every country before globalization made their own clothes. So it's kind of the industry of all nations. Everybody had their own manufacturing system. So what industry does is takes this cultural heritage from these communities where the raw materials are from and then showcases it through their products to customers around the world. And what communities and artisans do you work with? So we have three main projects. One in India called the Clean Clothes Project. Project. So it's made in Tamil Nadu. So everything is organic cotton, natural dyes, all made from sustainable and renewable resources. The second project is the alpaca project, all from the Bolivian highlands, um, where ranchers for millennia have been shearing and taking care of these alpaca. And then spinning the fibers into yarns, then knitting them in this mountain region in Bolivia, mostly by women. And then the Recycled Fibers Project in Guatemala, where, where organic cottons are respun and repurposed into new fabrics to make new materials. And can you tell me yeah. a little bit about how you guys choose what dye to use? So all the dyes are all natural dyes. So in general, the dye making process requires so many materials, water, electricity, chemicals. So if you think about like a production line from start to finish, like crop to closet, there's all these branching off points like in the 21st century manufacturing process. It's like forever chemicals, like polluted rivers, communities that are destroyed in their cultural heritage, not respected. So what industry is cool about industry is everything that goes into the clothes comes from the local environment. So all these natural dyes, for example, example, like um, shellac comes from the secretions of beetles that are left on tree bark. And you take that and melt it down and turn it into this dye, which becomes this beautiful, like, dusty rose. But then undyed, which is actually, like, the best for the environment, which requires no extra energy to create the materials and the dyes, and there's no chemicals involved. It's just respecting the fibers for how it begun. One thing that people kind of don't get when you say the word undyed is you think you will lose color. Mm -hmm. But with undyed, there's tons of colors between natural browns and um, creams and with the alpaca, all these different heather grays. So it's really showcasing the beauty that the earth has to offer. So this is the alpaca. So you can see this beautiful like toffee color. So all of the alpacas are sheared and then the fibers themselves are separated based on the color of the alpaca. So all of the tobacco colored ones get um, put together. Um, all of the heather gray ones get put together and then you can see like the richness and the depth of the color that's created. Eric, so LA leads the way in ethical and sustainable fashion movements. Can you expand a bit about how you guys like totally fit the bill? The most interesting part of Industry of All Nations is that not only are we using sustainable materials, it's sustainable processes. So from the very beginning to the very end, the whole life cycle of the product is thought out, including the people that are working for industry, the plants that we're using and the animals that we're shearing to make all of the clothes. So it's not just saying it's like, oh, like 30% of these pieces are recycled fibers and then, you know, the rest of the 70% are still like cottons or fibers that are, or polyesters that are kind of destroying the earth. So really it's about creating whole sustainable ecosystems and manufacturing processes that create a loop of production that can make this planet livable for millennia. 
And can you speak to the neighborhood being in Venice? Venice and Abikini is really like the center of LA's shopping district. So of course, if you want to have a shop, like this is the place you want to be. And it's so great to showcase what sustainability can mean, even though like now it's such a buzzword mm -hmm. and it can be thrown on anything as a marketing tactic, but industry kind of, it's like a soft play in the background. And we're really showcasing the clothing, the production processes, the people behind the clothes and um, the designs themselves. Yeah. Will you show Portia and myself some bestsellers? Of course. So this is one of our most popular pieces, the indigo t-shirt. So this one's been dipped six times in an Ooh. indigo vat. So each dip, the color intensifies. And um, at a price point of $40, it's definitely one of our best sellers. This is another one that I was telling you about that's undyed. So this is the wild cotton hoodie. So this color, the brown, is the color of the cotton itself the, when it comes off the plant. There's an so, ombre effect. Yeah, so there's like a heathering effect where the color has these highs and lows, which creates this like rich depthness to it. And it being undyed means like so much water and electricity and resources are saved in the entire manufacturing process. And these are another one of our most popular items, the classic jeans. And these are made from 100% recycled cotton in Guatemala. So everything is processed and then put down back into a fiber and then respun into a new material, creating this denim color that's beautiful. Portia, you work in fashion PR, so you've seen it all. You do have the pulse on what's going on. Can you talk about the shift you're seeing towards sustainability? the major shifts towards sustainability when it comes to fashion. I think there's two different areas. You've got one where people are claiming to be sustainable and maybe only an element of their business is. But then you've got the other extreme where people really are a little bit like these guys. They're kind of sustainable to the very core. I work with brands that even the buildings that they operate in are heritage buildings that are solar powered and all the team drive electric cars. Um, and I think we are seeing a massive shift. And I think you only need to read articles in the business of fashion to see the change that's happening within our industry. And I think also from like a consumer perspective, I think we as consumers are probably shopping way more consciously than we were before. I know I certainly am. I'm, I'm not shopping anywhere near as much as I was purely for that reason to try and be a little bit more mindful as to what I'm buying. You work with tons of independent brands. I work with 105 independent brands, <laughs> yeah. When someone new comes to you and you're shaping their image or you're shaping their you know PR message from the ground up. Yeah. What's that like? I mean, look, we don't work with anyone that we haven't had like one-on-one -on -one time with. It's not like a brand comes to us and is like, oh, we want to sign up to your services. And we're like, no worries, just sign this contract. Like mm -hmm. there is a whole process. We need to know that these guys are who they say they are mm -hmm. and that they're authentic. Everyone comes to you with different needs and different wants. And I think in terms of shaping that image, you gotta be realistic with a client as to what's possible. Like mm -hmm. often a brand will come to you and say, I want X, Y, and Z. And it's like, well, hang on, you're not even at A, B, and C yet. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start that? And do new emerging brands have sustainability pillars built in from the ground up now? It depends what you measure sustainability on. I would say a lot of them do because they're working on such a small scale, um, you know, in terms of they're not buying masses of fabric and then wasting it. Um, you know, often stuff is made to order rather than having like a ton of inventory. Again, a bit like these guys. And it, it, yeah, mindful limited runs. So yeah, I do think there's a lot of that happening right now. I would say certainly when I think about the brands that we're working with, more than 70% are definitely operating like that, which is nice to see. Ellie has got a lot going on. Can you fill me in on the diversity of the styles in the neighborhoods? So the different styles within LA, my goodness. In Malibu, people tend to be, um, it's a very different style. It's like beach chic, as I would call it. It's messy hair, it's no shoes. That's a very common thing. You'll go into Whole Foods and people will be barefoot doing their food shopping, which is brilliant. <laughs> but then, you know, you'll go to the Palisades where it's more Lululemons and like the husbands will be wearing Farity. And then you kind of come into Venice which is, I mean, it's kind of dripping with expensive brands here, but very unknown in the sense, you know, someone will be wearing a cotton t-shirt, but that t-shirt's probably about $500, but then you'll kind of go into like Beverly Hills and Hollywood, and it's a little bit more glamorous depending in which areas you're in. I know if I go out for dinner in the evening, I'll go with like the girls from the office, and we'll have an early dinner sitting at 6 p.m., and you've got people like me who are in that office wear, but then it comes to like half faint, you suddenly look around the restaurant, and there's like tits out, spray on, high heels, it's completely different. Um, but I love it. It's 
Los Angeles is slowly becoming a fashion capital. We've had brands start to do their runway shows here. I think Christine Dior showed here not that long ago. Tom Ford was here. It's definitely um, coming up further on the map. It's not London, it's not Paris, but it's definitely coming up on the, on the fashion map as a very serious contender. Through the lens of conversation and style, we have gone behind the scenes to get to know the fashion industry in Los Angeles. In a world where trends can be fleeting, we have learned from both Portia and Eric that staying authentic and innovative will give you an edge in an industry in constant motion. Beyond the glitz and glamour of LA, there is the undercurrent of sustainable fashion and individuality for those seeking both substance and style. See you next time on Talking and Shopping.